I mean, wow. Serious debate yesterday. For those of you that missed it, a lot of heavy hitters in there. Uh, for Ido Benvizi showed up to listen to what had to be said. Uh, my name is Donovan Sadiq. This is the Hot Seat Radio Show with Tay Wild Wilder. Hey, hey, you took my hey. intro. Tay is going to give us uh, a nice little recap because while she was at the debate yesterday, she took a lot of notes. I did. I really, really did. I, yeah, Yeah. I need to take notes. Um, Just to recap really quick, the the debate happened at the District 4 uh, Marina Valley Beach Golf Course uh, right by the, uh, what's that place called, the Review or the? Uh, I can't remember. Yeah, but. It was beautiful. It's a beautiful piece of land. Beautiful piece of land, but it's right between JFK and Marino Beach Drive. Um, a big thank you again to Mr. Eric Hefner, uh, the developer and the owner of the property who let us host there. Uh, before any BS gets out, let's just let's, let's just say it for what it was, and people, we are putting up the videos right now. There was over 200 people at this event, and that is not saying that Anybody who puts on an event on a weekend in a commuting city is not going to get 200 people. You put a debate in Moreno Valley or any commuting city Monday through Friday, the chances of participation are going to be very, very low because people are tired. Yeah, I mean, I talked to uh, a very nice young lady um, last night and said she really struggled to get there Thursday because she's one that works out of town. She was trying to haul butt up to right. 215 to make it to that event because she really wanted to be there. So, again, it, you know, it's time, time and place. It's always what we've always been told. Absolutely. Time and place. Absolutely. You know, uh, Thursday's event was a really great event. It 20 was, people. It was, it was still, it was... Yeah, it was, it was no a good event. Yeah. It was still yeah. a very nice event. It was a great introductory um, uh, meet and greet, if you will, with the candidates. Um, Two candidates. The two that did show up, um, I'm glad that they did show up. Right. Because um, for them, it was a jumping off point for Saturday's yes. event, and you can tell the difference. So, if you haven't seen the video from Thursday's debate, which was put on by the African American Coalition, the Denise Fleming cheering cheering group, um, you can see a significant difference in how uh, the candidates portrayed themselves and uh, what a difference a day makes, literally. Yeah. Uh, once again, Ulysses Cabrera was a no-show. Um, I don't think anyone should be Useless, surprised. useless Cabrera. Um, I'm extremely disappointed in that fact because I really thought that he would show up because it was a in defense. Um, he had it, three weeks' notice. He had a lot of notice, um, but I, I don't think he will be an independent actor. I don't think he can be someone that will make decisions on his own, especially when this is his candidacy that we're talking about, going out there and trying to, you know, get the people of District 4 to vote for him. And he couldn't even take the time to even just show up, say hi, and then leave. Right. Well, here's something a lot of people don't know. Um, The host, Mr. Eric Hefner, personally called all of the candidates to make sure that they would uh, attend the event because, you know, he has a vested interest in what he wants to do. And and, um, I believe earlier in the week he did meet with uh, useless Carreras and uh, gave him a demonstration because whoever's going to be the council member out there has to deal with that golf course. And uh, he met with Mr. Carreras and Mr. Carreras told him he was going to show up. So if you can't even keep your, keep your promise to people who are bringing businesses and um, development in the city, what are you going to, you know, what are you telling these, uh, reg- a regular citizen? I mean, this guy's a multi-million dollar developer. By the way, if you did not make it to the debate on Saturday, um, Mr. Hefner put on a very nice presentation on what he is actually proposing for the golf course. And um, it was very nice. It made me want to move. <laughs> right, right. And, and, you know, and some of the homeowners that were there that, that uh, border the property of Mr. Hefner's of the golf course, you know, of course, they have reservations and what it is. And a lot of feedback that I got from them was the fact that 
yeah, you know, they still have, you know, they paid a lot of money to live near the golf course and they have some reservations about the apartments and, you know, the more condensed, right, really so. yeah, of uh, people, which is rightly so. But they had no idea that this developer is bringing in a, a, a badly needed boys and girls club and they are for that. So they're, they're kind of softening their position because they're seeing that this developer, because when you say developer in Moreno Valley, that's a... That's an ugly word. It's just a, a, a real, real bad, ugly word. So a lot of those people are like, well, you know, we like that idea in a boys and girls club because it's sorely needed. So, you know, they got to see some of the things that this person, this developer is bringing in addition. The, the bottom line is, and this has always been my mantra, you can build whatever you want. What is in it for us as citizens? And if you don't have nothing for us as citizens, get the hell out of here. And I mean, he's a, he was a very, very welcoming, very open person. You know, he's like, hey, if you have questions, X, Y, and Z, please get a hold of me. And, he, you know, he gave out a nice little pack to mm-hmm. fully explain what his, what he wants, wants to, to do. do. So to there's no misunderstanding. that area. Right. You know, so it, it, it was No really hidden nice. agenda. No, no, no. Uh, promises nice. that don't come out. He said, this is where I'm going. If you have a, a suggestion, if you think there's something that's wrong in this, contact me and we'll, we could maybe make adjustments. And that's what he's willing to do. And I hope that it goes forward only because... Sitting in that room last night, you know, yesterday, last yesterday evening, seeing how beautiful it was. Yes. I could only imagine. I could even, I just couldn't even imagine what it is when the grass is all green. green. And there's people out there. The clubhouse is having a brunch Sunday brunch at church in the clubhouse or I mean, a, a quinceanera. It's a beautiful, beautiful hidden pe- little gym, Moreno Valley. Mm-hmm. And I really would hate to see that just die. You know, just die. Right. I mean, right. we need. It was just gorgeous. gorgeous. I, I was really impressed. All right. So uh, yesterday, the uh, debate took place. Uh, we're putting the videos up as we go. So don't just take our word for it. Look at the videos, like and share. And just like we said last night, this uh, venue, and let's get this clear. The venue is not about Donovan Sadiq. Who put this venue on is the Inland Empire Informer. And that is a conglomerate of people that you hear on this radio and other things that we do. So it wasn't a Donovan Sadiq event. It never will be a Donovan Sadiq event. I'm just lucky to have people that are interested in what's going on here in Moreno Valley. We've got Sean on the right. I'm on the. I'm a little bit in the middle. Tay's a little bit in the middle. Uh, some people on the left, and we've got you know Daryl Taylor. You got all kinds of people. So it isn't just a uh, one-sided agenda. The Inland Empire Armor is you, the listener. Because I know you guys don't listen, but you listen, but you don't listen. So, but you quote everything we say. Um, so let's, let's get into it, Tay. Um, starting off, it started at 5 o'clock. We started at 5.15 because the word was Mr. Corberis was going to come. So we kind of let Mr. Heffer do his presentation, which was a, a good thing, which is a great presentation. Again, if you have any questions, contact him or contact us and we'll pass the message on. And unfortunately, the show must go on if you're there or not. He was more than welcome to come and run in and take his seat. It didn't happen. So the thing starts off. Uh, anything on the moderator? Um, I have to give a huge, huge, huge shout out to Mr. Christopher Jones, um, the voice of Moreno Valley Debates. <laughs> I mean, he was present. His mm. voice was just, I mean... I have to give a hand to Chris Jones. And yes. when it started to get, you know, because some people started to get a little amped up, yep. he shut it down. He shut it down, right. I mean, he, his presence, he kind of, you know, it was just, right. I loved it. He was great. I, you ever have moderating, you know, needs, needs. please contact him. Find Chris Jones. Yes. yes. He is amazing. Right, right. Um, a lot of uh, Highland Fairview employees were there. Yes. And they, uh, uh, they occupy back as usual. Uh, we've had some of the African American coalition. Um, Denise Fleming's husband did show up. He looked, got on the phone with his wife, and said, "Yeah, baby, it's packed. It's packed, baby. It's packed, packed, packed." Yeah, he, he's making us look bad. He's it making us look bad. It was a really diverse group. Very of diverse. District four residents, you know, Moreno and, Valley residents and city folks. I mean, it was just a huge mix of right. of people, and that was that was awesome to because I looked down for a minute because I was taking notes, and I look up, and the entire I mean, people all the way in. Back. back right it was just people everywhere, everywhere. people looming outside the patio mm-hmm. doors mm-hmm. i mean it was people were like borrowing chairs you know it was just standard right room. i and, was amazed and you know and, and everybody asked me well you know how much uh, advertising did you put in, uh, in 
All we did was advertise it on Facebook and said, here's an event, show up, be there, be square. On a Saturday, where people are more than most likely to attend. You make it convenient for the residents. So the debate starts, Chris Jones gets in it, he gives out the rules, we're ready to rumble, take take it from there. Um, Everyone did their intros. Um, Mrs. Barnard started first. Um, You know, she came out look she has a lot of concerns and and that's really what kind of pushed her to go ahead and jump into uh, local politics it's decisions that have been made for the past 10 years that were really that have been really bad and detrimental not just to district 4 but to the people of Moreno Valley as a whole Um, this was my first well this was the first time the commish showed up Um, I adore the commissioner I think he is an amazing man he came out there you know he's with the parks commission and mm. you know he gave the definition of service and why he's there and he stated that you know there's three things his three was it like a three point plan or something was accessibility collaboration and performance he wants to get it done he wants to work with the people to make it happen and he doesn't mess around he said it i don't mess around and then uh hector diaz you know he's a small business owner he's a job creator and you know he has the educational background to kind of help um seat in, 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 in local politics. Um, so to kind of squash what was the rumors circulating around Facebook, um, Mr. talked about the incident that happened at his restaurant. What incident is that? It was the incident of a drunken individual that um, showed up to his restaurant, was kind of belligerent. Um, the local law enforcement was called and chaos, not chaos, but you know, it progressed from there. Right, and it's amazing. But he broke it down and he basically said, look, the person came in and didn't want to leave. He did indeed call the police. Um, he asked the gentleman to leave several times and the guy got, you know, you know, got aggravated with him because he was drunk and he assaulted Mr. Diaz first. Um, and he earned, like any human being, he defended himself. Um, the uh, law enforcement asked Mr. Diaz if he didn't want to press charges. He said no. Um, all of his charges were dismissed except for disturbing the peace. Um, he said he still kind of didn't know how it got to down to the disturbing the peace, but um, he just said, fine, you know, I'll do whatever it takes to go ahead and, you know, settle this so he can right. move forward because he is a business owner, he has a family. He didn't need that additional distraction in his life. So he was on probation for some time and in a few months he will apply to get that probation expunged expunged from the record. Mm -hmm. Um, So from what he said, it basically boils down to that's what he gets for being a nice guy. (laughs) Right. Right. Um, So hopefully that sells everything. He spoke on it. Um, Everyone in the room seem was seemingly okay with it. Sure. And I guess hopefully now we can just, move forward right right um well you know when it comes to instance like that the best thing to do uh, all do is to accept it get get ahead of it tell your story before somebody else tells it for you so uh, i'll commend mr diaz for doing that because like i said i do think he's a nice guy uh we all have stuff in our past even i i myself thank god i was in the military my discipline records will never be uh public public so and uh i uh, complete my career so it, i didn't do anything that you know, would jeopardize me being booted out of the military. But again, um, we all have a past. We've all done something. And, um, you know, if you're for public office, you really got to ask yourself, is there anything that can come out that might be a surprise that affects you and trip you up in your um, bid for election? And I mean, parking tickets. Anything. I mean, if Child you're support, at the club. Right. I mean, anything that could potentially come out, go ahead and get ahead of it versus it coming out and then 5,000 different versions of this situation gets explained when it's not even the right situation. Right. What happened truly. And then you have to go into damage control. Right. There you go. So the first question was brought up was about homelessness. Um, this is where... Well, I don't understand why that, that you know... Uh, there's only, according to the city, there's only 38 people that are homeless. I'm more. Than yeah, well, we're just going by the, I'm going by st- city statistics. Are you saying that the city's lying? 
I don't think the city <laughs> right. is accurate. With right, their, with exactly. Their fact, fact They're making it look good. They're fudging the numbers there, but yeah. Um, Mrs. Barnard said, you know, they have rights in speaking with them, interacting with them. Um, it, it's about, the question was about how to help homeless. Right. So, you know, she said it was a community thing and we need law enforcement, especially when it comes down to the encampments. And she brought up Orange County um, and, you know, social social workers and evicting, evicting them from unsafe and unsanitary encampments. Sure. encampments. Everyone else along the line pretty much said the same thing. No one really said how, how do they, they help the homeless. How do you fix it? How do we fix it? No one brought up that you know the homeless shelters that are that are in existence. No one talked about the homeless veterans shelter. Right. No one's talking about the things that are um, you know. We can talk to them. We can engage with homeless people. We can we can do that. And you know and. They, everyone was right on the fact that you can't help e- everybody. everyone because not mm-hmm. everybody wants, wants help. Mm-hmm. But again, the question was, how would you help homeless people? And talking to them, okay, great. But there's people in this in this county that run around making those. Fi- Have you seen those Ziploc bags yes. where it's yeah. like an overnight kit or, kit. or whatever? Mm-hmm. Um, that something along that line should have been you know, talked about, but it really wasn't. Everyone just talked about, you know. Well, you know, if I was asked that question and as a candidate, I would have said, well, we have these empty warehouses. One thing we do as a city, we can utilize the warehouse or get a nonprofit to utilize their house in conjunction with the city to address uh, the homeless people and have a distribution center or whatever you know, and make a bed facility or something. I mean, that's what I was kind of looking at saying we are a warehouse city, but we've got these empty houses. Why not use them until they do get occupied yeah. by something of that? That's something I would I mean, say as a, a tax, solution. It's a good tax write off to a ruins building. There you go. But there again is a solution to a problem. And then we moved on to the gas tax and, you know, how to get along to um, go along and get along with city council. No, what, what does that mean to go along, and get along? Um, so for people that are listening, that don't understand. Like, is there a problem in our city hall where, People are just up there going with the program or going with uh, the end. Of course. People just, you can clearly see on Tuesdays who has what and because it's clearly divided. Okay. I mean, even before um, Mark has, you know, sure. got on the dice and Baca got on the dice, the crew prior to, you can see who had what plan and who was on one path, who was on the other. And then it was just you know, rubbernecking to watch the accident okay. happen. Okay, let me do this. I'm, I'm going to go off topic real, real quick. What idiot mayor obviously is a Highland Fairview employee. His vision is what? And what is wrong with his vision in your opinion? Do you have a problem with his vision? I have a problem with the way that, one, he treats people because he's only engaging with the people that go are Highland Fairview right. employees. Right. He doesn't. He doesn't talk to anybody else. He's very condescending. Like that whole thing with the planning commission. You see, he had an agenda, and then you know he stated that he doesn't have to talk, explain to anything to anybody. Mm-hmm. Well, yes, sir. Yes, you do. You work for me, right? You know, you if you're not going to sit up here and and talk about your plan for the planning commission because you have an agenda. Be a man and explain your agenda and explain the agenda so everyone's not left wondering what, what are you the doing? hell's going on. What are you doing? So, I mean, do you plan for what he's trying to do? I mean, what is his agenda? That's what I'm saying. But he's he's not very transparent okay. in anything that he does. Right. You know, we can see that, you know, he's, you know, trotting Cabrera around the city. He, Using his official title, which is against the law. But, but even when okay. he was running, he didn't. He didn't associate with anybody that was quote unquote anti. So he didn't right. show up to any debates. Well, no, the first one he showed up to the parking lot and didn't. Yeah, leave. he was in the parking lot and left. He saw a bunch of uh, he, people in the parking lot. He's not what I would expect or what I've experienced oh, as of a leader. Of a leader or a mayor or even a grown man that has um, that has a plan. Well, he he doesn't talk. I've just never seen anybody like, well, I don't have to deal with you. And he doesn't deal with people. You try an appointment, never get a call back. You try to do things. Well, it's, it's been almost a year since I've been waiting for an appointment to deal with a resident, a senior citizen, Hispanic lady 
who has a problem and he won't meet with me. So, yeah, I, yeah. But it's this, this whole division on the dais that has to come to an end. Everyone up there should have, you know, their own goals for their specific district, but their one goal should be for the betterment of Moreno Valley, Valley and its as a residents. whole, right? As a whole. But again, that's not there. Okay. Um, so, you know, Hector went back and said, you know, he accomplished the mere dream. He, you know, people know who he is. He's not. Yeah, he's person. worked since he was seven years old. Yeah. yeah. Um, and I think the one thing that I did like is that he said that he wanted to leave a legacy, which I think is actually pretty smart. You want to leave, you know, you, you want to look back and say, you know, wow, you know, he, you know, Hector Diaz, he really did what he could, right. you know, for not just District 4, but for the residents. And I think, you know, people, you know, when you look back and you talk about like George, wow, you know, he really did a lot right. for the people. For the time that he was there. Right. And that's the kind of legacy that he wants, that imprint that he well, uh, George make. Price was there for two years, uh, and he, he really did a good job and made an impression. Uh, what about Donna Jensen? She was there for two years. I really can't speak on LaDonna Jensen because mm-hmm. I didn't live in District 1. Um, I... She's a nice lady. <laughs> right. Well, no, I mean, she yeah, is a nice no, lady, I understand. Yeah, she but is. I can't speak on her record because right. I don't know or I can't say or can't see what she's done. Right. I, I don't know. Right. Well, well, well you know, I, I worked with her in those two years and I can say without her, I couldn't have accomplished the uh, projects that got done in the district. As she said in the debate when she was running for reelection, um, she was the council person. I was the person with the ideas. Uh, Sometimes you got to. Sometimes you work with people you might not agree with, but you have to learn to compromise. You got to know to compromise. But uh, my thing is, it's not about me. It shouldn't be about egos. It should be about what's best for the community, and that's why I put my animosity aside to work with Ladonna Jenkins. So I would say her legacy is a lot of things that we did accomplish in District One when she got elected. So. Um. The commish, um, he said he's a retired activist, but he's actively retired. Actively retired. There you go, commish. Oh, man. Right, right. <laughs> um, he, wor- he said he works for us, the people, mm-hmm. um, and he's not a rubber stamp person. He re- refuses to be bullied. He will not bully anyone else. He is there for the people, point blank and period. period. And you can't get mad at him for it. I mean, he has a, a very long-standing record in, in public service. Everybody knows him. He's Everybody done, knows he's, him. He goes to every event. Uh, a person got up and said, you know, will you, as uh, representatives, come to town halls? If the uh, people, Because we do town halls, and these representatives don't show up, Maria Baca. Uh, they don't show up. And he, we know the commissioner show up. You just got to yeah. let him know, and he, he'll be there. And he's there. Um, Miss Bar- Mrs. Barnard, Barnard. Um, she said she's not a pushover, and I mean, t- to be honest, she really showed it last yes, night. Yes, she is not a pushover. She, uh, she called out for Paris and said, hey, he's not here, by the way. She said, as a reminder, yep. this chair is empty. Right. So um, she's used to push back, and she gave an example, a great example, her job. She's a social worker. So she's, you know, she's knock on doors and say, hey, I need to talk to you about X, Y, and Z. People tell her, no, they slam the door. She's all right. Take two. Let's try this again. Right. So I, I like her her passion. I like the passion. Mm-hmm. I, I I think last night really was her moment. She really shot. She really shot. She really last did. Night. Um, her edu- um You could tell she did her homework. She, she watched got an education. She probably watched the video of her performance first debate. Not saying that's it was a bad performance, but I'm saying no, is you, you can see the growth, that. right? You can see the growth and just in a couple days. Right. You can see that she came out there gangbuster, swinging. gangbuster. So. Um, we went and the next one was about the issue of the, the streets. Um, Mrs. Bernard talked about, um, can, you know, let's look down different avenues versus telling people. Let's look at grants, you know, let's look at making, ensuring the revenue of the gas tax actually goes to the, you know, the streets, the things need. And one really good thing that I thought was great that a lot of people really appreciated was all these businesses that are bringing in these trucks yes start knocking on doors and saying hey pass the collection plate you guys need to start paying for mm-hmm. these roads that was something that i don't think i've heard um, um or maybe it, I- it, it, it was spoken in the, in the wlc wars oh see i wouldn't yeah for the wlc wars but it was spoken in the wlc wars but see what's going to happen is uh, that's why when Ito would make comments, in Ito Bendizi is is is, a, is the developer of the w- World Living Center. Um, 
he would make comments like, you know, oh, well, the trucks come in at this time and that time. You don't own those trucks. No. So how could you even say and, and dictate traffic flow? You can't dictate traffic flow. Oh, they're only going to be coming in between 7 o'clock and 9. How, how do you control that? You don't control that. And, uh, of course, these people thinking that this guy's a god. Oh, yeah, he's, he does everything. But uh, people were saying that. He doesn't own these trucks. No. They're owned by individual mm-hmm. companies and sometimes cell phones. And so if they're the ones tearing up our road, you know, like, like she said, and the people have said in the WLC wars, uh, these companies should be paying Mr. Benbezi. Since your project is bringing these trucks, maybe you should pay a, a higher tariff to maintain the roads that are going to be uh, going through your property. Mr. Diaz wanted to, you know, re- reassess the funds in the budget, reevaluate where we're wasting money and where we could repurpose those funds into not just slurring the streets, actually improving and repaving these roads that a lot of these neighborhoods really, really, really need. need. Um, none, none worse than Edgemont, but, you know, we got to spread the wealth a little bit. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, and, of course, the commissioner, you know, bring in the experts, talk to the residents, figure out, you know, where are the worst streets? You know, let's start racking, stacking these streets, and let's figure out this budget. Right. What's going um, on with this money? A person to contact would be Ahmad. He's the city uh, engineer and um, director. And, um, as a matter of fact, he's – you can call him at time, and he can explain that. See, that, that's why I kind of was kind of disappointed. I mean, he's on the track. Right. But as a candidate – if a street is an issue that is in every city, that's a common, you, you, as a politician, you always talk about filling potholes. That's a common thing. The first thing that I would have done and I did when I ran was I met with them and understood how they decipher what streets gets done, whatever. So when I go out there and that question came up, which is going to come up. But I think what he was talking about was get with the, get with the residents of his specific mm-hmm. district and say, hey, where are we where are we sorely lacking you know where are our roads like really really bad and then you know let's figure out where what needs to be fixed first and then let's present it and say okay how can we we have this road that is horrible that really needs to be fixed by the way district three let's let's start working on alessandro (laughs) because right um su tires on a suv a couple Mm -hmm. hundred bucks i'm just saying um (laughs) it's it's so i i i appreciate his collaborative effort especially mm-hmm. because he doesn't drive all the roads right so he doesn't know all the mm-hmm. roads but he knows that if he talks to the residents they're gonna say oh hey i live off of so right this road is really i bad. have a pothole the size of kansas going mm-hmm. please help me get this fixed right so i can i appreciate, appreciate him that. for that mm-hmm. effort. um <laughs> and this is kind of where it got this this the next question is kind of where it got dark <laughs> okay okay <laughs> um special interests a dark money. Dark money. What does dark money mean? Oh gosh, it's this dark cloud that continues to hang over the city. City. And a certain candidate that doesn't show up. A 22 year old kid that has three thousand dollar signs over the city. And Friday, if you looked at his 460, he received ten thousand dollars by the end of the reporting period, all from I believe twelve different companies that occupy the same address. Yeah. In so, Orange County. Dark money, people. Okay, so let's, let's get it. Um, the commish. He says he doesn't know about it, he's not involved, but he wants to come together and talk about it. Okay. This is where you start to lose me. Because if you've been in this town, I've been in this town a year and a half. Mm-hmm. That is the first thing I learned about was all these quote-unquote white envelopes that are being passed out to certain people. And you had white envelope re- recipients in the back of the audience. Again, you want to slide me an envelope? I'm perfectly fine with that. Right. I start at a minimum of 150 k There you go. Minimum. Um, let, let, let me do some clarification. You've only been in this city a year and a half, but uh, let me say that uh, Tay is a longtime Inland Empire resident from Riverside. Or Corona, I'm sorry. No, Corona. I was uh, born in L.A., raised in River Tucky. Right. River Tucky. Yep. Um, and lived in Corona at the first year after I retired. Sure. And then uh, decided to slide out to Moreno Valley because warehousing. Mm-hmm. Thought I can get a good job, job out over there. Here. Mm-hmm. And turns out it couldn't. No, because <laughs> they would have to pay you for your expertise and they don't want to pay Moreno Valley residents. Temecula has no problem paying. Right. Um, so that's just my little clarification. People want to know, well, you only been here a year and a half. No, she's been in the Inland Empire for a while. Yeah, I've been in the Inland Empire since 88 so there you go um uh mrs barnard said hey 
it shouldn't be allowed. She said, but we as residents, as voters, we need to do our due diligence and do research on these candidates. We need to see and check those 60s and, and, and check these people's backgrounds. And who's who supporting they're them. dealing with. And who they're who supporting. Are, who is handing these people all this money? How is it? And she brought up, why does a 22-year-old need these huge signs, these ridiculous, oversized, mm-hmm. overpriced signs, and yet he does nothing, show up to Nowhere. nothing Nowhere. in the community? I still don't understand it, but she says, again, we need to hold people accountable and then those people, those city staffers need to have personal accountability when they accept this money from, you know, from people. It's it's always going to be a tit for tat. Sure. If I'm going to hand you money, I'm going to expect that you're going to have to do something for me. I mean, it, that's it, common, it's sense. common sense. That's common sense. But okay. Again, I've learned that uh, common sense ain't common. Not in Myrna Valley. Um, a, a, a good example, Tay, you're, you're a woman, beautiful woman and like that. If you if you were at a club or a bar and I and I bought you and I offered to buy you a drink. As a woman, what what are you thinking when I offer you? That's my intro to because I'm cheap. I'm gonna take it. Well, well, well that's true. But mm-hmm. but in general, I have an ulterior motive. Oh, of course. To oh, get something course. for either conversation, be but it your the phone sad number. Part is your feelings gonna get hurt because yep. that's just not how it rolls. Right. But again, in general. In general. Yeah. But there's always you know a give and take when it comes to you know, people giving you money. Mm-hmm. They're gonna have expectations, and I don't understand why this. I mean, I don't care if it's from a developer or from a specific group that backs you. I don't care if it's the Democratic you know, Party or the Republican Party or teachers or whoever. They're going to no matter who it is. It's, ne- it, it's never really 100% in good faith when they're going to turn around and say, well, remember when we donated to you? Now you kind of right. have to, you know, swing our way. Right. Well, one thing I like about Ms. Bar- Barnard is she said you can check, of course, at zero. You know, so she's she's saying, go ahead and check. I got zero. So she has no, uh, so, you know, saying it and actually researching are two different things. Just because they, they these uh, candidates say stuff, I still tell people, like the great Ronald Reagan, trust you. I just want to verify. Yeah, trust but verify. We all know you that. Know, so, um, and then Mr. Cabarrus, again, I don't understand why us as people as residents, I'm telling you right now, 12 businesses occupy the same exact address. Don't you think that's a problem? And why is it doing that? Because I don't think you can do that as a business. I, to be honest, I think it's a lack of knowledge. Right, but I'm telling you, that's what's going on right now, and that's what's showing on the four six. Um, Mr. Diaz also asked uh, answered the question. You know, he said he worked from the age of seven. He's hardworking. You know, he's you know he talked about treasurers and accounting managers and all that stuff. He really answers a question per se, sure. but I kind of got the gist of what he was saying. You know, he's not really here for it, mm-hmm. and he did reiterate after the after the debate that he is not one. To, he, that's just not who he is. Okay. So, cool. Um, moving on, the animal shelter was brought up, um, and I will say that question was not answered. No, How to it stop wasn't the killing of right. the animal shelter? It was not addressed by any of the candidates. Not at all. We do in this city have an issue of the animal shelter. Um, the way they reduce the numbers is by euthanizing mm-hmm. these mm-hmm. poor animals. Um, what the candidates did talk about were things that are already currently in place. Right. A good Google search or even a, a trip down to the animal shelter would have answered all of the questions for you. Mm-hmm. Or even talking to a lot of the people that the residents that are wholly and fully engaged and volunteer at the shelter um, would have probably helped them out tenfold. Um, if, if you're looking for a source for information on uh, questions you have on the animal shelter, a good page to go to is Wake Up Mobile. Yes. They can tell you everything you need to know about what's going on in that animal shelter. Now, I know some people are going to say, well, LaDonna Jimson did a great job. She, I'm going to tell you this. Um, and as a former ca- uh, candidate, I'm going to tell you this. The easiest way to answer that question about the animal shelter is this. We need to put a moratorium on the killing until we find out why and what's going on. I've asked LaDonna Jensen to do that. She refused to do that, which is another reason why I believe she was bounced out of her seat because everybody loves animals. Not everybody, but a majority of people do love love animals. And when you give a director who seems to have a problem with killing innocent animals... 
doesn't make you look good. It makes you look like, uh, what's that lady from the 101 Dalmatians, Cruella DeVille? Cruella DeVille. And that's what it made it, it made LaDonna Jimson look like. Are you going to give this guy an award for doing something that the residents don't want the city to be involved in? And there, there needs to be, um, we need to stop the killing. Let's just be real. Yeah, let's just put the moratorium. The idea that we're, we're killing these innocent pets, and there's every day I, I, I see on Marino Valley Matters uh, Facebook page where people are losing their pets. I don't know how many, how many people, I don't know how it's possible for all of these dogs to escape from yards from homes and I understand people do steal dogs because mm. my mom had a someone went in her went in her backyard yeah, and stole her dog. Mm. But again, people need to be more responsible with their pets and then when their pets do get out, make sure they get the word out in time and always check the shelter, shelter first. first. Because that's usually where people take them. Um, but we can't as a city continue to allow innocent dogs and cats to be killed. It, it, it makes the city look bad. It's an ugly, ugly thing that we are allowing to happen when there's so many resources and things that we need to do to um, to, to adopt, send these dogs, adopt these dogs. Right. And, you know, an, an, another good question is, well, if we stop uh, euthanizing, then the animal shelter will be full. Then so be it. Just stop, t- stop taking intake. Then we need to start working with mm-hmm. our other our partners in other counties and trying to figure out what they do what we right. and how we can emulate whatever progress that they're having with with, with you know rehoming these animals mm-hmm. versus just killing killing them, them outright so i just it's a, to me it, you know to me that that puts a really bad i mean we already got a bad murder valley whatever i mean murder we murder people as well as animals too i mean it's just you know it's just really something that we, we should get away with but you're right the candidates they they had some cute answers and it was good stories but they didn't really answer that question. i do appreciate that they're all animal lovers yes who does so i'm glad that question was brought up because you don't have to be district one uh, representative to solve that problem it's a city problem it is very much a city problem so. oh and <laughs> the brown act oh boy how many violations of the Brown Act has this city done? Several. I just... Okay. <laughs> Let's jump right in. Uh, Sh- Shalinda said, you know, all, sh- all people should be held accountable. Enforce it, set the example, but enough is absolutely enough. I think a lot of us on the outside looking in to city staffs, pretty much the same thing. Yeah, we say the same thing. It, it, you know, it's, it's, to me, it's not enough to, just to say, oh, no, 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 when are we as the citizens going to start holding these people accountable? And the only way we can do that is if we have the information. Once you got the, it's what, you know, we can sit here on the radio like we're doing right now and be frustrated, frustrated, but what are we doing about it? It's a good question. Um, Hector Diaz said, you know, no one is above the law. We have a duty to represent the people and their interests. Um, we need to work together. We need to be um, active, not just pro, not just reactive, but proactive. Mm-hmm. And then, you know, we, if we have to recall, then let's do it. Right. And you know, I, I we've I, done recalls in the city, so it isn't impossible. I mean, now that the threshold is a lot higher, we've reduced districts, but you can still do a recall. Um, the commissioner said that, you know, we need to be responsible people and we need to start scrutinizing these people that we, that we vote for. And I wholeheartedly agree. We really need to start, you know, as much as people throw, you know, tickets and all these other fun stuff, you know, when it comes to their, the people that they don't want to vote for, we need to do that across the board for everybody. Mm -hmm. If we're going to sit there and we're going to vote for these people, then we need to scrutinize these people. How ethical are these people? Mm -hmm. And if they're not, if they're not behaving in an ethical manner, how the hell are they going to sit on that dais and and represent us in an ethical manner? Right. And also, how much money and time and damage will that person do if we had done homework from the beginning? I mean, I'll give you an example. Uh, Victoria Baca sued the JPA. That was over $100,000. Um, in legal in legal fees, um, Idiot Gutierrez contested his illegal appointment on the seat years ago. That cost over a hundred thousand dollars. I mean, look at the money. That's two hundred thousand dollars that could have been used for other programs within the city. Yeah, and that's what we got to talk about. How much damage are these people going to do if we don't do our homework first? If they're unethical to begin with, hey. But that's what makes me wonder. 
how much more damage are we going to allow the people that we vote for do to to do to this city? It, it just be, you know this goes back into us as residents using our better judgment when it comes down to casting votes mm -hmm. because we're not thinking of a year down the road, not thinking six months down the road. We're only thinking of what we're doing today. Today, we're not thinking of the impact it will have when we elect these people who don't act, you know, in our best interests. Because then we have all these lawsuits. We have, you know, all these these this infighting and and you know these embarrassing situations at council meetings. Right. And it does more. All these people are doing more harm than good. And they're not helping us grow as a city. They're hindering our progress as a city. And for us to be, what, the second largest in the empire? In the county, in the county, in the in county, the county Riverside. Riverside. How mm -hmm. in the world are we back in the Stone Age when every other smaller city around us master is planned, moving forward master planned. in progress? They, and we need to stop this. Yeah, well, these other cities are moving forward because they get professionals like yourself, who's a logis somebody who's in the, in the logistics, and you say, hey... We need you to work with this developer, and so we're going on the right track. We don't do that. We hire uh, everyday people, which is okay because common sense is a big deal. Yeah. But sometimes if you want a master plan city, you really got to get the experts in there that know what they're doing, and we don't have that. And I think another problem that we have with our citizens is people are so frustrated with what's going on in this city that this is just a, um, what do you call that, an interim city? You're only going to be here five years, then you're moving. Yeah. And that's what's happening. And this shouldn't be a city where people use it as a stepping stone. This should be a place where people, you know, they drive up, they hear about Moreno Valley, they look at a beautiful home in a beautiful area, and they say, you know, this is the place where I want to raise my yeah, kids. Yeah, wow, amazing. The schools yeah. are great. The shopping's great. Right. The people are great. We've got a lot of things to do here. There's things for my kids to do. There's things for mm -hmm. me to do here. And that's, that's, that's not happening. Right. It's not happening. And that's sad because Moreno Valley it has so much potential. Right. But we're not pushing our city beyond, you know, above and beyond what it could be. We're settling for what is, and we're just, oh, okay, well, great. So where people get so frustrated, they either leave or they just throw their hands and want nothing to do with right. anything in the city to begin with. Right, and thus you have areas like Edgemont, you have areas like Moreno uh, uh, area, and, um, you know, these old areas that don't change. They just don't change. They just say, hey, we don't want anything to do with it, whatever. And that's where we're at today. So It's um, sad. You know, and a, a person like me who's been here for a long time, i would be here. So when this thing, 25 years from now, is never built, which I, as a person that has a logistics background, I do not believe, I think this is land speculation. It's never going to be built because if it was really going to be built, I don't see out. anybody building the support infrastructure for a super warehouse. Even to, with all the warehouses we have right now, there are, we still don't have, I haven't seen one truck stop being built. I haven't seen one tr a truck transmission shop being built, tire shop, wash, uh, wash interior for the trucks. No infrastructure for the trucks, much less a parking area for the trucks. And, you know, I hate to jump ahead, but mm -hmm. I, I really, what Roy brought up was actually a valid point. It was a valid point. It was a very valid point because no one, none of the candidates did talk about, you know, spending in mm -hmm. Moreno Valley. And it is a big thing because. There's nowhere for us to throw to spend my dollars, mm -hmm. and I want where I live is usually where I want to spend you my dollars. dollars. But we don't have that here in Moreno Valley, and I've been saying that since I got involved in the political thing. Even have a warehouse job, seven dollars an hour. I don't care if they're paying you thirty-five dollars an hour, either or. You're not going to spend it here. Mm -hmm. you're, you're going to Riverside. You're going down to San Diego. You're going to LA. You're not spending it here because we have nothing. Once we gave a racetrack, that was our claim to fame back in the day. We don't have that anymore. So. Um, let's take a break real quick uh, before we go I want to mention Menio Stero Menio has been in business 27 years I believe this is his 27th year Menio sometimes you could catch him on the uh, uh, Facebook pages and he's a very colorful guy and he says what's on his mind but if you need the hookup on your car radio tip, that's the guy to go to small business owner and he is a legend in this city so I strongly recommend going to Menio's on Alessandro and Ellsworth this is the Hot Seat Radio Show we, we will be back in the second hour